unfortunately, my job doesn't get me to the Caribbean anymore, so uh, not to worry about that one. And uh, first of all, it's just fantastic to actually be in a room with other fellow human beings who are not just my wife or the three dogs, which I think I've been looking after for the last uh, 18 months. And it's wonderful to be here today just to share a little bit of our journey uh, within Vodafone. Feel free at the end of this to, to ask questions. My biggest challenge before I came here today was what was I actually going to wear? I didn't think the onesie, which I wear for video calls back at the house, was quite appropriate. So I've, I've sort of parked that one. And then uh, I was with Guy last night for dinner and he goes, nobody wears a suit anymore. And I thought, oh my goodness, I, I've brought my jacket with me. So I'm going to try and I put my jacket on this morning. And uh, yep, I need to get back to the gym pretty quick, I think, is the answer to that question. So anyway, today we've got a little bit of a walkthrough around what we think is procurement's next frontier. We're going to share a little bit around Vodafone and the Vodafone procurement company. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our journey from where we started to where we are today. And when I talk about where we are today, you're going to see some real things, not PowerPoint. So, and, and if you ever get the chance to visit us, you can come and look at these capabilities live. And then we're going to paint a little bit of a picture around what we're investing in today to try and build the future of tomorrow around our digital infrastructure. So that's kind of the structure. Uh, there is an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Uh, you can ask any question you want. Uh, it doesn't mean I'll answer it, but I'll, you can ask any question you want. Okay. So let's uh, kick off. So uh, when I was in school, this is from my primary, what was called primary six, for those of you so about age nine or ten uh, back in school. And little did I realize that this would become a unique selling point in future when I went into business. And this was my school teacher, I think, from Carluke primary school who wrote to my mum and dad said Ninian is a disruptive influence in the class and I thought fantastic that's what we're all told to be now isn't it to be disruptive to kind of think differently now at that time it was probably stopping other pupils learning so it probably wasn't as appreciated perhaps as it is now but my mindset continues to be one where you should always challenge try and disrupt and experiment and do things differently uh, and that's an ethos we have uh, both in Vodafone as a company and in the procurement company where we experiment, we try stuff. We don't always get it right, but we take the learning from that and then try and uh, uh, improve our business as we go forward. So a little bit about Vodafone. You all know Vodafone is a mobile company, uh, I guess. Uh, you probably remember all the adverts like I did uh, from back in the 80s with David Beckham and a small football team called Manchester United. Uh, and that company has grown to be quite a large telecommunications company. So roughly 21 markets today, 44 billion of revenue. But probably what you didn't know is 22 million TV customers in Europe. So we're the second biggest uh, cable TV company in Europe uh, after Sky, who are obviously satellite. And we've also got something called IoT, so the Internet of Things. We've got 123 million connections and we're the biggest IoT company in the world. So the Internet of Things, we helped connect that and we, we are leading that uh, whole area, whether it's connected cars or connected machines going forward. And also, you can see on the bottom right, 28 million broadband customers. So if you live in Germany, it's quite likely that your broadband, your cable, your TV, your mobile, hopefully everything, actually comes from Vodafone. So it's a slightly different footprint to that which we have in the UK. Now, to support this, we founded back in 2008 the Vodafone Procurement Company. And the ethos behind the procurement company was really to try and pool all of the spend and procurement activities together so that we had one set of negotiations with our supply base, not 21. And I've got a great story for you, which you will love. I won't mention which company it was, uh, but it was one of the Scandinav Scandinavian telecommunications companies who provide the equipment. Uh, I won't say which one it was, but it was based in Sweden. Uh, and uh, it signed a number of non-disclosure agreements with our different companies. So they told our Italian business, you've got the best pricing, but don't tell anybody else. They told our Spanish business, you've got the best pricing, but don't tell anybody else. And they told our UK business, you've not quite got the best pricing, but it's pretty good, right? Uh, and when we did all the analysis, obviously, we actually found out it was the German business that had the best pricing, and everybody else's pricing was higher. So really, part of our ethos was to try and get single pricing single approach to vendor management, and then to create that center of excellence over time. 
which we've done in Luxembourg. In Luxembourg now we have over 250 procurement category managers. We have roughly 800 people in the whole function. And we have a three pillar model. We have people in Luxembourg in our strategic sourcing center, people in our operational companies, in the 21 operational companies. And then we've also got some shared services in Ahmedabad in India that support us. And as you can see here on the list, uh, we buy everything, steel, concrete, complex telecommunications equipment, marketing, advertising, travel, maybe a little bit less travel at the moment, a bit more travel hopefully coming in the future, and then products and services such as relationships with all the handset providers plus all of the in-home communications equipment. Roughly about 25 billion of spend uh, per annum uh, and highly centralized. So if I look at the procurement company today, about 83% of all our spend is rooted through the procurement company. Uh, we're bringing in two new categories into our spend as we're increasing the perimeter of procurement. So that percentage will fall and then we'll build it back up again to about mid 80s. Those new categories are tremendously exciting for us. Uh, and one of them is uh, content because we've not really bought content before as a company or it's been very, very fragmented. So now we're supporting our business in the big relationships with Netflix, Amazon Prime, HBO, Discovery, et cetera. And we're applying really good procurement practice to those contracts which we didn't always have access to before because we didn't have the skills and capability. So for us, a new frontier, uh, but also for the company, a new way of thinking about how you buy that con content and the commercial models which we can take from other parts of the business into it. So really good fun. Now our journey is a super interesting journey. For those of you who are in procurement, you will all have the same challenges as we have and continue to have. So when we started off back in 2008 in the procurement company, we didn't actually know what we spent. Anybody ever have that feeling? When somebody says, what do you spend? And everybody sort of runs around for a week and we say, we think it's 100. And then your CFO says, if you're not sure, why don't you write to the supplier and ask them? Have you done that one before? So we were doing all of that. We were writing to the suppliers. We think we spend 100 with you. Could you please confirm? The supplier would write back, obviously, and not quite tell you the facts because they didn't want to know the 100 was actually 200. So therefore, they would get more attention. So for us, it was really about that basic process start. And we started with what do we spend, where do we spend it, and who do we spend it with? And that was our journey sort of 2008, 2009. As we think about our data journey, it's actually in three segments. You've got that basic understanding of where are we and can we have some access to data. The second part of our journey is, is been working super hard on visualizing that data. Uh, and I don't know what you're like as individuals, uh, but my boss is fantastic. She's absolutely brilliant. You give, him a call, give her a column of figures and she can spot the one number that's wrong. That's not my skill but I can see visually if something's wrong, if it's a nice, easy visualization of the data. So for the past four or five years, we've been working really hard on visualizing that data. And when my uh, new boss back then, when I first got the job, said he's coming to Luxembourg on the 17th of September, which is just over five years ago now, to do his in-country review, in the April of that year, I said, when Nick comes, we will have digital scorecards and digital analysis, which he can deep dive down into look at the performance of procurement. Before that, we had something which is wonderful, and you must all try it. It's absolutely fantastic, it's called PowerPoint. You, ever, you know that tool? It's absolutely brilliant, isn't it, yeah? Those who've used PowerPoint, because PowerPoint allow, allows you to guide the discussion, isn't it, yeah? And you spend all your time showing the good stuff and hiding all the stuff that you don't want to show to the boss, right? And every graph you put in PowerPoint starts at the bottom left, goes up to the top right, has a nice green arrow on it, doesn't it, yeah? Now, the good news is PowerPoint is still there. The bad news is when you digitize your procurement function, you can't hide stuff anymore. Because when you've got a digital scorecard and your manager says, can we look at that one which is red, then you have to explain what the red one is, as well as the green one in the story. So PowerPoint, fantastic for people who are not hitting the numbers and not hitting their targets, because you can guide the discussion. But scorecards are way more valuable. Our experience on the scorecard stuff is that we used to spend 
three weeks collecting the data. We used to then pull it into PowerPoint presentations, and then we'd have a review with the 21 countries. And what did the 21 countries say? That's not the numbers I recognize. That data's out of date. So you'd have another discussion about the data, and you'd start the data collection again. So in our company now, we've got near real-time or real-time data and analytics. There is one source of the truth. All 850 people in our function have access to the one source of the truth, and we've banned PowerPoint from performance reviews. But it's really easy to slip back into PowerPoint, yeah, because people then take a screenshot and paste it into PowerPoint. I'm going, what are you doing? That's not the plan. Please let's use the tools that we've created to actually do the performance review of the function. And that's a little bit around what we call making data speak. And I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit of the capability which we've got there. The third part of our journey, which I don't think we're completely there yet, but we're working on now, is making data act. So building in the intelligence to your tools that when they see something, the machine, if you want to call it the machine, acts on what it sees and makes the corrections. So a good example of that now is when purchase orders come through our systems and we have about 880,000 POs per annum that come through, obviously they've got classification and coding on them, yeah? Which is quite important, feeding back into your basic spend analytics. So our machine now can say, I've had a look at these purchase orders and I think we should make some corrections. And it provides that to the category manager saying, I don't think this is network equipment, I think it's IT and it's a laptop, yeah? So our systems do that today. What the systems will do shortly, and I think we're nearly there, is actually say, I saw these POs going through yesterday. I've already corrected them to this analytics. And if you want to undo it, please press this button. So we're not doing approval anymore. It's just if you want to undo what I've decided as a machine and you think I've got it wrong, please do this. And then, of course, it learns. So when people talk about data quality, and isn't it a nightmare? Yes, it's an absolute nightmare. Will your data ever be perfect? No. But if you can actually get the machines that are actually issuing the POs to learn and start scrubbing your data over time, it will get better and better. So really for us, that's where we're moving to now is trying to make that data act and make it act in an autonomous way as much as possible. Because whether you like it or not, correcting data really is quite and has been in the past a manual task, and we want that fully automated, and we don't see why it shouldn't be. And the last piece you've got there is autonomous procurement, which I'll come on to in a, in a second, which we're now live with our first minimum viable product, and I'll share what that is with you today. Right, so what have we got? So I've got a selection of two or three things here just to share with you to give you a little bit of flavor, but you have an open invitation uh, from me at Vodafone to a guy called Reinhardt, who will now kill me that I've mentioned his name here publicly. If you would like to get an online demo of real live data, if you write to ninian.wilson at vodafone.com, and if I get round to answering, we will set that up for you, and you can actually see the capability which we've built. So again, I've got two or three blocks here for you to walk through. First of all, uh, and you've got the partner here, Syrian Labs, one of the early things we enabled was commercial contract management. This is especially important when you've got a group capability or a center of excellence. The hardest piece when you run a center of excellence is you do a deal in the middle. How do you know that that deal gets executed fully upon in Italy and all the benefits are delivered? So our commercial contract management capability can run at the global level, looking at key partners, and also runs at the local level, assuring contract performance locally for us. And that's been a great success for us. We started off saying we were going to do everything. Every single contract we have, we do about 3,500 per annum. And then quite soon we realized we should follow the money. So we segmented that back down a little bit. And now we do about 40% of the value we manage proactively. But I do want to get to 100%. But to get into 100%, I've, be, I've got to be more autonomous. Because I can't put people on that all the time. Because as you know in procurement, you never have enough people for all the work you want to do. And that's kind of life in our function. So that piece is, is really gone great. The second piece I've got there is the SCM control center. Uh, that was the old screen. I've just refreshed it. It's now a kind of round circular screen. 
where you can stand and you can move uh, items around and look at different capability. In that, we look at two areas. We look at efficiency of the function and we look at effectiveness of the function. So for effectiveness, if you come from financial services, you'd call that compliance, but I call it effectiveness of the function. Uh, every single piece of data is collected in near real time. Everything, as you can see from that middle, is digitally and visually shown. So you can get a real clear snapshot of where you are. You can drill down into every single country in Vodafone. You can drill down into every single category. So the five major categories we run. We can drill down to a cost center. We can drill down to an individual. So if Guy is actually doing some work where he has to approve a purchase order, and if I really wish to look, I could probably figure out how long Guy is taking to actually approve the purchase order. And you think, Ninian, what does that mean? Well, if he takes less than a second, is he really looking at it? Yeah? Or is he just approving it? So we can do all of that analytics. <clears throat> Recently, we've got our finance function has put another step in our uh, PO process because they want to review every single purchase order. This is in one country. Yeah? So we said, that's no problem. Now that extends the process. It frustrates the people who are trying to get the POs out to get the goods and services. And we know that 97% of those POs go through unchallenged. So then I can go back to the finance function and say, this is great that you've done all this, but do you realize you're only challenging 3% and it's this value? Is that really what you want your people to be doing? So again, that data-rich environment really allows you to make those, those type of decisions. On our efficiency, uh, cost of a PO, anybody know the cost of their PO in the room? or virtually, the virtual people I can't hear, obviously, it used to cost us three euros 60 to issue a purchase order in Vodafone, three euros 60 when we started this program. We're now down to one euro 80, and I've given the team the challenge to get the PO cost down to one euro. My team have got no clue how to do it, but they've got a challenge and an ambition of kind of how to get there, and they've made huge progress already. Retrospective purchase orders by country, by department, by function, by category. You can see everything. We can actually see the last four years now of history of POs going through our system. So you know when you set out to build your ERP system, you set out with a blueprint. As you implement it, it changes. So now we're using uh, some tooling to actually give us the real view and we can watch every single PO going through. And you go, Ninian, why, why are you bothered about this? Well, if I do that, then I can see trends. I can also see where they get stuck and where they get stuck, then I can decide if we put some robotics in to improve the process time for that. <clears throat> so again, gives you that real insight into data. And then catalog management. For many years, people have talked about catalog management. What level of catalogs have you got? Uh, I checked yesterday, year to date, 75.2% of catalog spend within Vodafone, which helps us drive significant standardization and a standard operating model for the business, all in our control center. Now, when we add both compliance and effectiveness or efficiency together, we've got a single measure because we've probably got 20 measures there. And we've got called something called the happy PO. Have you got a happy PO? We've got a happy PO. A happy PO is one that flows straight through our system without any rework. It's fully compliant uh, and, and hits the SLAs, which we've set as well. And we monitor happy PO rate and happy PO rate yesterday when I looked, was 95.6%. So we've still got an opportunity for improvement, and that's the way I like the team to think, because I say, that, how are you going to get to 100? And, and I'll have a lot of procurement people saying, Ninian, it's not worth getting to 100. You know, you need to back off a little bit. But I want the mindset of getting to perfect, because if I get the mindset of getting to perfect, they will come up with new ways and new thinking of how to get there, yeah? So we try and keep that push going. Uh, and then finally, we're digitizing our relationships with supplier. Uh, we've uh, joined Trust Your Supplier Network, which is, which is led with, uh, by IBM, and is a blockchain way of vendors becoming qualified for a number of countries, uh, companies. If you're a supplier to big companies like Vodafone or British Telecom or IBM or Cisco, the qualification process is, one, expensive, two, takes a lot of time, and three is really difficult to keep up to date. So we're partnering with this company who are using blockchain technology, 
which almost by def definition is up to date for everybody at the same time, to actually reduce and lower the cost of qualification for those vendors. So they qualify once and have qualified for a number of companies, which we think again is a positive contribution uh, to that ecosystem. Now, where are we going? Because all that digital stuff is all sort of, you know, four years old, it's all kind of there. I'm getting kind of bored with it. And I was sitting thinking with my team, where do we go next with digitization? What's the next frontier for procurement? And my team in July last year brought me something they called, we're calling it autonomous procurement. I said, right, okay, I quite like the sound of that. What is it? And they said, well, imagine Nini and if the computer could choose the vendors, create the tender document, send out the tender document, analyze it when it came back in, negotiate the contract, sign the contract, upload the pricing into the ERP system, and then do a final report to say it's all done and finished. I said, brilliant, absolutely br bullshit, but brilliant, really like it, <laughs> absolute rubbish. And they said, well, hold on a minute, because if you look at the different tools that are out there, there's a lot of niche tools that do bits of this process. And actually, for certain standard commodity items, you're running a tender document that's fairly a balanced scorecard. The supplier's filling in criteria. It's a fairly standard evaluation. Now, I must admit, the bit that I really loved was the negotiate the contract bit. And I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll believe that when I see it and then sign the contract, we've already got that digitally enabled anyway, right? So that's fairly straightforward. So our minimum viable product went live eight weeks ago. It does some of the vendor selection. It does run the tender process with a balanced scorecard on criteria. It does do the evaluation. I looked at the negotiation of the contract. I think that's still a little bit ropey, if I'm, if I'm honest, but it's a learning capability, so it will learn what the negotiation is, and then sign in the contract it does. So we're now rolling that out to categories. And for us, that's super exciting, really, really exciting, because I think that's where we're going. Now, for my team in Vodafone, and a lot of individuals in procurement, that's kind of worrying, right? Because they think, oh my goodness, but my job is doing tenders. My job is writing down balance criteria. Yeah? And I would say, well, that's part of your job for some of the categories. And we're still going to do that work for the really strategic categories. But there's a whole area of spend, and I don't know what it's like in your companies, that we just can't get to, if I'm honest, right? And we kind of, we, we've got higher levels of uh, delegated authority, et cetera, because, and we're not really managing it. But just imagine if you could put those automated tools in to help individuals in your business almost be self-sufficient but still follow the procurement guidelines, still follow the procurement process, still have a competitive approach, and to be able to do that all in an automated way. And I, there is no question in my mind that procurement is heading rapidly in this direction. There are many, many different companies out there who are sort of running to get share in this space, and I think it's going to be tremendously exciting for the next two to three years in procurement as these tools really take off. And you will have people in procurement say, no, 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 that's, look, that's not going to happen, right? I'd be the same people who were saying that e-procurement would not happen back in the 1990s. They're probably the same people in the UK who are queuing at petrol stations today, right? Sort of being a bit kind of crazy. But this change is definitely coming. And, I, and I'd say to everybody in procurement and supply chain, grasp the opportunity, learn with some of the tooling, and at least sort of increase your understanding of where the world is out there. Because for us, if we don't experiment and learn, we'll just sit, right? We might have done some good stuff before on scorecards, et cetera, but we've got to keep pushing that frontier forward. So for us, accelerating the digital journey, autonomous sourcing is live within Vodafone. I haven't seen how many contracts they've signed yet with it, but I will be reporting that back to everybody in the next uh, couple of months to show what we've done. Now, in terms of how we're thinking about us in the future, I think I've got another key message here, is that don't try and do everything by yourself. Uh, we are trying to do quite a bit by ourselves because we've got quite a bit of scale, and that autonomous sourcing tool we have built ourselves in-house with our own SI capability 
within, within Vodafone. But we are working with a number of key partners here. You can see some of the names down there who we work with. And our thinking is how do we bring those partners together into an ecosystem which then we can get more out of than the individual partners can get themselves. And we're also looking at new capabilities. I've got blockchain capability here. Everybody, everybody likes blockchain? Yeah. Everybody wanted to be a blockchain company, didn't they, two years ago, because it added about a billion to your corporate enterprise value. As soon as you said the word blockchain, everybody went fantastic. So within supply chain, I'm fortunate position. I'm also the sort of executive sponsor for blockchain within Vodafone. So I'm the person who holds all the steer codes and we figure out where the investments are coming. We've got three blockchain capabilities up and running and in place already today. But I think some people come at the question from the wrong angle because they come at, we've got blockchain, what can it do for you? That's not how we've got a problem. What technology can we use to help solve the problem? Sometimes it will be blockchain. Sometimes it will just be a standard database or sometimes it might be an off-the-shelf tool. But we are now uh, looking at this in detail uh, and we've implemented it. And the next piece for us is going to be around uh, software management, which you can say, well, that's not really supply chain, but kind of is if you get into a position where you need to know whether you're compliant or not with your license conditions. So we're looking now at, uh, at blockchain for our software asset management capability across our 21 operating companies and across all the data centers, et cetera, which we've got. So for us, that's around a little bit around creating the future. And then within Vodafone, we've also got our, our own startup incubator, and that's within the supply chain management function. It's called Tomorrow Street. Uh, and I've got the T-shirt, and I'm wearing the T-shirt today. Uh, we have found that incredibly difficult to, to bring to life. So that incubator incubates not just procurement tools, but other capability and innovation for the business. And for me, that's one of the new frontiers of purchasing a supply chain. It's also a little bit of a holy grail. I remember speaking to someone who was the chief procurement officer of a large company, and he said, Ninian, life's great. He said, I no longer have any savings targets. I don't have any working capitals targets, any supply base reduction targets. I only have an innovation target and how many innovative suppliers I can bring into the business. I said, fantastic, maybe let's catch up in six months. Uh, six months later, I met the new head of supply chain for that company who said, <laughs> Good news, Ninian, I've got procurement savings targets. Did it, right? so, so I don't think you can ever get away from the basics of why you're there and why we exist. But I think you can climb up a little bit the ladder and say we can bring some extra value to the corporation. And for me, that's about bringing innovative companies with innovative ideas. But I must admit, it's really tough bringing in small companies to work with big companies. I remember when I first talked to the legal department, they said, oh, we'll come up with a new contract for these smaller companies. I went, brilliant, that's exactly what we want. And they came back and said, it's down to 122 pages. I thought, fantastic, that's going to go well. So it's now two pages, right, as our initial contract. Now, the type is really small, but it is two pages, okay? So we've made a few steps, but that was a lot harder than we thought it would be. But I think it's something procurement functions should continue to do. So with that, I actually wanted to finish uh, one of the ladies in the office. I said, listen, can we have a picture of uh, Star Trek? And she said, Star Trek? What's Star Trek? And then she gave a picture of the Millennium Falcon, and I went, that's Star Wars. And she said, is there a difference between Star Trek and Star Wars? And I said, kind of, yeah? And she said, what, what's the difference then? Well, I said in Star Trek... There was good goodies and baddies, and she said, that's okay. And I said, in Star Wars, there was goodies and baddies, and you know who the goodies were, because they all wear white, and we had Darth Vader who didn't wear white, right? So it was kind of very clear. But I said, for us, the frontier was really Star Trek. And then I gave it to my corporate comms person. They said, oh, we can't use, we can't use the enterprise because of copyright issues. I said, oh, give me a break. It's a procurement conference. They're not going to be going. But what I just encourage you all to do whether it's Star Trek, Star Wars, or any other film, to really reach for the next frontier in procurement. It's within our grasp, but to get there as a function, we've all got to experiment, try things, see if they work. If they don't work, stop them quickly. Sometimes I keep going too long and I don't stop them quickly, because I believe, personally, things will work. But for us, it's been a fantastic journey. 
as I say, you're all welcome to come and have a look at some of the digital tools so you know that it's not bullshit. It is real stuff. It's there and you can touch and feel it and see it. So with that, thank you very much. And maybe if Scott wanted to ask a couple of questions. Scott. Uh, thank you, Ninian. Uh, great session, boldly going where no speaker has gone before, obviously. Um, now, if anyone has any questions from the floor, we do have a microphone available, so if you want to stick your hand up. Uh, but also, I did encourage people, to obviously, to engage with our speakers via the app, and I'm pleased to say that lots of people have. So I think we'll start with a couple of questions from here first. And one of the most popular questions was from Elsa, so thank you, Elsa. And it says, how are you integrating sustainable procurement into your processes? Well, wow, great, great question. And probably uh, if digitization is the trend of our times, the second one is around sustainability, without question. Yeah. Uh, in November last year, we announced uh, as Vodafone, when I say we announced, my boss announced, because she wanted the publicity, which is fine, uh, that we'd be incorporating sustainability targets into all our tender documents. And those uh, are sustainability is under three pillars, digitizing society, inclusion and planet. And if you look at a tender now document from Vodafone, uh, if it's a high risk health and safety, it's 10% of the weighting. Around inclusion, it's 5%. And around planet, it's 5%. So up to 20% of the tender weighting is around sustainability. I think on planet specifically, we've also got our cost teardown lab so we take the equipment, we buy it, take it to bits and figure out all the cost, et cetera. We've actually done now that now and have assessed the carbon footprint for our suppliers. Because at the moment, there's lots of estimates out there of what the carbon footprint is. And we are trying to ground it a little bit more in what the real numbers are. But I actually think this isn't a question for Vodafone. This is a question for the telecommunications industry. Because we all work with the same suppliers. So it's an area we can probably collaborate together a little bit more to drive performance into our supply base. Because if BT go into meeting, Cyril goes in today and asks Ericsson for something, and Ninian goes in tomorrow, yeah, and then Liberty Global go in on Wednesday, and then someone else goes on Thursday, ah, come on guys, we should get our act together and really help drive those uh, uh, tier three carbon savings. So, so that's what we're doing. Uh, we haven't got all the answers, but we're certainly trying to get there, yeah? Okay, great. Uh, were there any questions from the floor before I go back to the app? Yeah, question here, if we'd have the mic, please. If you can just state um, your name and where you're from, please, before the question. Hey, my name is Justin Sadler-Smith uh, from Jagger. Um, great uh, story, great journey you're on, but how do you see the skill set of the procurement professional changing within your organization and outside of that as well? Yeah, super question on the skill set and how that will change. Uh, I think two things. I think we are changing some of the people we've hired in the past. So we have, I think, eight data scientists who've now been working for us for, or with us for the last four years. Uh, and five years ago, I didn't actually know what a data scientist was. So I, I didn't really understand. But now we've hired a few of them, and they're, apparently they're really helping on the digital journey, right? So I think there's that understanding of data, I think, is important. We're also asking our category managers, when they do their category strategy, what's their data strategy for the category? And we've kind of never asked them that before. And they have to do one of the slides saying, here's my data strategy. So we're trying to get them think a little bit more, more differently. So what do I think the change of I think people have to be more digital savvy, for sure, no question. Will some of the traditional procurement stills be required? Yes, absolutely. Uh, because you can't do everything virtually. And I still think there's a place for that negotiation, relationship building, et cetera, with key, key partners. So, so I do see a change, more digitization, more scientists, data scientists in the organization who understand structure of data and how to get it. Uh, but I, it, it's not a, and by Wednesday, everything will have changed. It will be, as it's been in the past, an evolution of the skill base, yeah. Okay, I think we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. Uh, we will see more of Ninian later on on the leadership panel at 12.30 today. Uh, but for now, everybody, please thank Ninian Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,